Welcome. This lecture is called Nails, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. We all know the good, those nails that come in, the patient or client has nice, clean, fresh nails. We hardly ever see those anymore, but when we do, we know that they're good. But now let's talk about the bad and the ugly. And I hope to, to be able to give you a better understanding of what makes nails look bad and what makes nails look ugly. So first of all, I want to review the structure of the nails themselves. We know that nails are part of the skin and the skin is consistent of the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis has four layers to it. The stratum corneum and the stratum granulosum become important when we're talking about nails. The stratum corneum is the superficial most layer of the skin. And within this layer, we have the skin extensions, namely hair and nails. And we know that hair and nails both have keratin. The keratin is formed from this particular layer of the skin. The nail unit consists of not just the nail plate. It also consists of the nail bed, the skin that's below the nail plate, the nail folds, the skin that's around the nail plate, and the nail matrix or the root of the nail that forms the actual nail plate. And nails are affected by any disease that is a disease of the skin, because again, nails are an extension of the skin. But nail problems can also reflect systemic diseases or trauma or infection or anything that can be acute or chronic to the nail unit itself. So as a review, the various areas of the nail unit include the nail matrix, which is at the proximal aspect, responsible for the growth of the nail plate, the nail folds, proximal and distal, the nail bed, and the nail plate. Looking at it from this view, we can see the different areas of the nail fold. Proximally, you have the eponychium. Distally, you have the hyponychium. And then of course, on either side, you have the lateral and uh, the lateral nail folds and the distal nail fold that makes the surrounding area around the nail bed and the plate. So I wanna point out the importance of the hyponychium, the skin that creates the cuticle. This is the area where the nail fold starts proximally and it extends on both the sides and distally. And the goal of the eponychium is to protect the emerging nail plate. It's also responsible for shine and smoothness of the nail. So any damage to the eponychium or the cuticle, which is the visual portion of the eponychium, any damage to the cuticle can cause problems with the nail plate itself. This becomes very important when we're talking about pedicures because the cuticle is, is an important point of protection for the eponychium and the nail plate itself. The nail plate itself is, consists of the stratum corneum of the, from the nail bed beneath it. And it has a dense keratiz, keratinization and it forms a hard surface that we, we know as the nail plate. You can see through the nail plate when it's a normal nail, when it's a, um, a clean, fresh nail, you can see through the nail plate and it looks pink underneath. The nail bed is very vascular. And so when the nail plate is of normal color, you can see the pinkness beneath it. As I said, the nail bed lies directly under the nail plate and it consists of skin. It, it is a form of skin, both epidermis and dermis. And beneath it is bone. Uh, very often you can have a bony prominence that pushes up on the nail bed which then often pushes up and can deform the nail plate. The amount of keratinization is, is different on the nail bed than other parts of the skin. And this becomes important when there's trauma to the nail bed, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But within the nail bed itself, there are ridges of keratin that are present for the purpose of keeping the nail plate attached. It's important to maintain that healthy relationship of the nail plate and the nail bed. Here's, here's a, two pictures showing what happens when that nail plate is removed. On the left-hand side, 
you can see this is a fresh removal. You can see how the nail bed is slightly different from the skin around it. There are no skin lines. Also, you can see the degree of vascularity. Uh, you can see the, the um, area, the tissue is, had been bleeding and that's because it's a highly vascular area. And of course, proximally, the white lunula, which is the visible portion of the matrix or root. On the right-hand side, this slide is showing what a nail bed looks like a few weeks after a nail avulsion. Now it's healed up nicely and it actually resembles normal skin. But still at this point, the nail bed is the same, uh, has the same consistency of nail bed skin, which does not have skin lines and does not have excessive keratinization. And the nail matrix is actually the root of the nail. The matrix is responsible for producing the keratin of the nail plate. Any damage to the matrix will show damage in the nail plate itself. When podiatrists do surgery for ingrown nails, the surgery involves removing the part of the, of the matrix. Uh, the lunula is just one part of the matrix, but it actually goes back a little more proximally. And the, again, the, the matrix is the root and the, the, the cellular component that produces the, the corresponding nail plate. So when we want to remove a portion or a nail totally on a permanent basis, we have to remove the matrix. What you may not know is that there are two different parts of the matrix. There is a proximal part and a distal part. And each of these parts is responsible for producing a different part of the nail bed. The distal matrix is responsible for the deep portion of the nail plate. And the proximal matrix is responsible for the superficial portion of the nail plate. So nail plate deformities can either be superficially deep or both. If there's damage to the proximal portion of the nail matrix, then the superficial portion of the nail plate will be affected. This is often seen um, when you have pitting of the nails. There's damage to the proximal matrix, which causes a superficial problem. And then obviously the same is true for the distal matrix and the deep side of the nail plate. Okay, so let's talk about now what is causing all these ugly nails. First of all, it's important to know that things can go wrong in any part of the nail unit, whether the matrix or the bed or the plate or the nail folds or the relationship of the nail plate to the nail bed. So let's talk again about the eponychium and the hyponychium. So the eponychium, again, is the proximal portion, which we all know as the cuticle area. And the hyponychium is the distal portion that really stops anything from entering underneath the nail. It's a natural barrier to water, to moisture um, and to infection. So anytime that area, the onychodermal band of the hyponychium is irritated, for example, excessive uh, curetting of that area, it can cause a separation between the nail bed and nail plate. And then you lose that natural barrier and it's very easy to get an infection through that area. Similarly, if the cuticle is cut back on the uh, proximal aspect on the, on the eponychium, it's also an area where you can get an infection. So while it's important, it's important that pedicures do not involve cutting the cuticles, uh, which is different than within the hands. Our hands are not in moist, dry, damp environments all day, like our feet are. So with the cuticles being cut in the foot, there's a, there's a high chance of both fungus and bacteria entering that tissue. And you can see here on the picture on the right at the proximal aspect of the cuticle, it looks very inflamed. You know, it's very possible that a bacterial infection has, has begun to occur here. So the nail matrix itself, as I said, you can have a problem with the distal matrix causing a problem in the deep layer, the proximal matrix causing a problem in the superficial nail plate, but you can also see transient problems. 
And, and by transient, I mean where they come and go. And if something is going on systemically and it's going to show up in the nail plate, it's going to be because there's a problem within the, the nail matrix or the nail bed. Um, but you're going to see it as a transverse line going across the entire nail plate. And I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. So the nail bed is a very important structure. And the relationship of the nail bed to the nail plate is equally important. A normal, na normal nail bed, as I said, has ridges that allow that nail plate to stay attached. And it lacks the granular layer of the epithelium, as other skin has. However, an abnormal nail bed produces that granular layer and produces keratin. And very often, it's, it almost looks like there is a soft nail that is sitting on top of the nail bed. And that's because of this abnormal granulation and abnormal keratin. When this occurs, very often the nail plate will separate from the nail bed and that process is called onycholysis. So you can have direct trauma to the nail bed, uh, whether it's a laceration or um, some type of injury, whether it's a crush injury or something, something falls on the toe. Uh, you can also have micro trauma. You can have a problem with trauma occurring, small traumas occurring over and over. For example, a runner. Um, often a runner will have, have jamming of the nail and it can damage the nail bed um, it can, and can pr produce a subungal hematoma. Um, but also, you can have a tumor. There can be a tumor within the nail bed that puts pressure on the nail plate itself and separates the plate from the bed causing onycholysis. And as I said before, you can also have a bone spur on the bone that sits underneath the nail plate and this can put pressure and, and um, chronic microtrauma on the nail bed that can cause separation of the nail plate. So what happens um, over time is that this nail bed builds up the keratin and builds up the granulation tissue. And as I said, it can happen with trauma or infection or when the nail comes off, but it can also be a result of, of systemic diseases, certain dermatological conditions, uh, and, and certain drugs. And, and of course, any type of neoplastic problem um, and sometimes even an inherited uh, condition can cause that as well. But once you get that nail bed keratinization, it is very difficult to keep that nail plate on the nail bed. Anything that causes a stimulus to the nail bed to give you abnormal keratinization causes onycholysis. And again, onycholysis is when that nail plate separates from the nail bed. And once that separation occurs, You've lost that natural barrier at the distal end, at the hyponychium, and it is very easy to get an infection underneath the nail, whether it's fungus or bacteria or, um, or other types of de debris. It's very easy, it's a very easy access point. So what else can cause the nail bed to become keratinized? As I said, microtrauma, certain types of derm dermatitis conditions, um, certain types of diseases such as psoriasis or lichen planus, all these, all these things can cause direct stimulation of the granulation tissue of that nail bed. And then you get the onycholysis. So again, onycholysis is separation between the nail plate and the nail bed. And as I have written here, it's a recipe for disaster because it's an entry point. And once you get that tissue, thickened tissue, it's very difficult to get rid of. So I mentioned about a biomechanical precursors. What I mean by that is the way the foot functions, and, and of course every foot functions differently and every individual has a, has a different foot structure and, and gait pattern. Uh, the way the foot functions can cause microtrauma on certain toes, which causes that nail bed to keratinize. It's very common on the great toe, uh, especially in someone who has a hyperextension of the toe and the shoe is causing, the toe is causing uh, trauma on the, on the shoe at the top of the toe. The second toe, when it's long, very common to find 
a, a hypertrophic nail at the, on the second toe when it's long. And on the little toe, the fifth toe, if there is a rotational deformity, very often the shoe rubs against the nail. So the most common toes are the, the big toe, the second toe, and the fifth toe. And what happens is you get stimulation from the microtrauma. It produces granulation tissue on the nail bed, and then you get onycholysis. And then secondarily, you can get fungus. So I think that the nail plate and the nail bed have a very special relationship. Number one, the nail plate is dependent on the nail bed uh, in order for it to, to grow forward and to slide over the nail bed, the nail bed has to accept it. So it has to have a means of attachment and it has to have a healthy enough surface so that nail plate can grow forward in a normal manner. Um, and very often there are problems that prevent this normal, normal growth pattern. And I, I think over the years of both seeing patients' nail problems and the history of their nail problems and a nail problem I experienced myself, I think there's a relationship that most of us don't really appreciate between the nail bed and the nail plate. And often that nail plate is dependent on the nail bed, but also the nail bed is dependent on the nail plate. And this comes into play when there's an ingrown nail and that nail digs deeper into the tissue, the nail folds change. And when there's an ingrown nail on both borders of the toe, the nail bed is forced to change. So there's a synergistic relationship here that I don't think is appreciated enough. So as I mentioned, ingrown nails, uh, the, the medical term is onychocryptosis and uh, the nails can be slightly incurvated or severely incurvated and even curved under. And what happens is if you we're looking at these pictures that are from the end of the toe, which we call the distal tuft. And what happens is the shape of that skin, the distal tuft skin and the nail bed that lies proximal to it is changed by the shape of the nails. So by, by altering the shape of the nails, we can alter the shape of the nail bed and promote a more normal surface for the nail to grow on. Uh, so one thing that, that is now available, of course, is a nail restoration from Onifix. And the process does exactly what I just said. It allows the relationship of the nail bed to change as that nail plate is changing. So as the nail plate is being um, uh, almost pulled from the sides to take the pressure off the nail folds, that nail bed can flatten. This is a great example and I wanna thank, thank Aaron for allowing me to use the slide because I think it's a really good example of the changes that can occur. And starting at the bottom, uh, when the Onifix was first applied, you can see both views from the end of the toe on the right-hand side and the shape of the nail on the left-hand side. And as you move forward in six months, you can see how the skin beneath the nail has, has, is no longer puckered. It is flattened to some extent. The nail bed itself has flattened. And just look at the shape of the nail, both on the right-hand side pictures, that curvature has totally lessened, especially medially. And if you look at the left-hand side, the shape of the nail, the width of the nail, as it grows distally and as it grows out, has been restored. Um, so I think this is a pretty impressive example of what Onifix can do. Um, here's a few more examples. This particular one was a 14-year-old 14, uh, 14 girl. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, by looking at the distal tuft or the end point of the skin, how the shape has changed, it's flattened. And again, that's because the nail has flattened. Here is an older gentleman, um, eight weeks. This is for his second toe. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that skin just puckering underneath the nail. Those are very painful to patients because the skin and the nail are very tightly um, uh, adhesed and it's very painful. And you can see after eight weeks that that relationship has started to change. 
and the skin has started to lessen its grip on the nail. And then here is um, another woman who you can see on the right, the curvature of the nail and the distal tuft. And on the left, you can see that the onycholysis has decreased. You don't see so much of a separation. Uh, and you can see that nail starting to flatten. So one thing that I've learned recently is that we, we see these we see this situation all the time. We see the, the a toe that has lost a nail or previously lost a nail and the nail is starting to come back, but the nail bed shrinks. And it it didn't it it didn't I didn't appreciate the reasoning for this until it happened to me. Um, but we all see these people, they come in and they complain that the nail just won't grow over that ridge. And there's actually a term for it. It's called the disappearing nail bed syndrome. This is a relatively new term. Um, and really what, ha what it means is that the, the nail bed appears to shrink. And it does. What happens is the skin that's past the nail bed at the distal tuft or the end of the toe, it seems to come up and over and takes the place of the nail bed. And the nail just can't grow over there. Uh, you can even get skin lines on that skin. And once you get those skin lines, there's no way that nail is gonna attach to the, uh, to the nail bed. And this is a serious problem. It, it, it's many of us uh, take it lightly, but for, for an individual that this has happened to, it is a very challenging problem cosmetically. And they, and they wanna get that nail to grow further out and it's very difficult. Uh, this is a one-year case study. This is actually my toe. Uh, I, I injured my toe in, um, it was actually at a conference when I was lecturing in Virginia. And uh, I, of course, stopped to take a picture of the nail that, that was almost evolved. I try to keep the nail on for a while, which is a, a whole other conversation. We can talk about the pros and cons of keeping uh, an injured nail on or taking it off. Um, in the end, I ended up taking it off. The picture in the middle is shows that keratinization of the nail bed. That is not a nail. It is keratinization of the nail bed that looks like a soft nail. And I know you've all, you have all seen these people. But also, just past that, at the shiny pink area, that's where normal nail bed should be, but it's not. And if you look on the right side, you can see that that separation has differentiated even more. And the, the end point of the nail bed is now gone. And it is very difficult for the nail to grow past that area. It can be done and there are things that we can do for it. Um, and I certainly welcome referrals to, to be able to work on that with, with your clients and your patients, but it is difficult. Okay, so now let's talk about how nails can be dystrophic. You can have, as I, which I said before, you can have nails that are keratinized and they can either have an infection that is set in, usually onychomycosis or, or mycotic nails or fungus. You can also have nail bed keratinization without infection. Um, however, usually when you have the keratinization, you get the onycholysis and it sets up the scenario for a secondary infection or fungus, but not always. Uh, and then you can have nail pathology where there's non-keratinization, which are the pictures on the left. There's uh, pathological changes in those nails, but it's not a keratinizing process. So the, the non-keratinizing process, um, it, you can see there's uh, it, inflammatory problems such as lichen planus or psoriasis, which is pitting. You can have ridges either longitudinally or horizontally, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and certainly you can get peeling and splitting. Um, and again, these are non-keratinizing conditions. The keratinizing conditions that are not fungal, um, it's very common. As I said, it sets up for a fungal infection because you've got onycholysis and it, that allows the infection, effective agents to get underneath, uh, underneath the nail plate and attack the nail plate, but you can also have um, problems even with meta metabolic conditions with diabetes or circulation problems that cause nail bed keratinization. And then of course you've got fungus. 
the medical term is called onychomycosis. And what you are left with are thick, brittle, discolored, dystrophic nails with subungal debris. And that nail separates from the skin below it from the nail bed. Um, and keep in mind that fungus loves warm, moist areas. And that's why you see fungus more on the toenails than you do on the fingernails. Again, because our shoes are moist, warm environments. But not all fungus, not all patho nail pathologies is fungus. Um, approximately 35 million Americans do have nail fungus, but there is a very large percentage, up to 50%, of, of dystrophic nails that are not fungus. And it's difficult to know when it's fungus and when it's not. One of the things that we, we can do is we can test for fungus in different ways, and we can even test for the strain of fungus now to get a more targeted treatment um, uh, protocol for that particular patient. And I just want to note that if someone has a fungal problem in the skin, it's very difficult to get rid of the fungal problem with the nails until we resolve the skin. So mycotic nails most commonly show up um, with the distal subungal presentation, meaning it starts distally. And again, this is usually secondary to onycholysis. But you can also see a few other types of fungus. You can see fungus that starts proximally. Uh, usually these, this is found in people with um, HIV. You can have primary fungus that is often usually white and very superficial. And then of course you see the picture in the middle and, and when, when the nail is completely embedded with fungus, the nail in the nail bed, it's called total dystrophic nail fungus. Okay, so when is fungus not fungus? You know, I, as I said, many of these cases are not actually fungus and, and often they don't respond to antifungal medication because they're not fungus. Um, these are examples of psoriatic nails. Pitting, usually um, one of the first things you think of is, is psoriatic nails, but they can also present uh, further advanced that look just like fungal nails. You can have warts underneath the nail. Uh, when the wart is underneath the nail, it, it looks like a keratinized nail bed very often. Uh, the, the color can be yellow, it can be black. Um, warts, um, sorry, fungus also can be yellow or black in presentation as well. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish if it's a wart or if it's fungus. The nail matrix itself can have deformities. Um, as I said before, if the nail matrix it has anything wrong with it, the nail plate will come up, come up deformed. Um, and sometimes you can get scar tissue in the nail matrix as well. There are many systemic diseases that cause changes in the shape and the growth of the nails. Uh, two of the more common ones, which, which you most likely have seen over the years, uh, the first one is called clubbing and there is a rounding of the nail bed. Um, it's the, the toes are usually bulbous and um, everything just kind of looks rounder. Um, very common to see this in respiratory conditions in, and in um, GI issues, um, sometimes also with cardiac disease and cirrhosis. And then spoon nails. Um, spoon nails are very common in iron deficient individuals. Uh, there are a few other things also, a few, few other uh, systemic problems also that can cause them. Um, but but you, if you see this, one of the first things you should, you should um, caution your patient about is what their iron level is like, because it's, it is common in iron deficiency. And sometimes you'll see it. And then when you see the, the, the um, individual six weeks later, it may be gone. So when you, when something progresses out with the nail growth, um, it can indicate that when it was there or when it was proximal, at that point in their, in their health, they had some type of problem and it showed up in their nails. Uh, a lot of things can change the shape as the nail grows. Um, again, all these, we've, we've talked about most of these, um, these issues and the shape of the nail plate actually changes. So again, the relationship of the nail plate and the nail bed become very important. And by um, using a supportive measure to help flatten out that nail plate, 
It helps flatten out the nail bed and helps preserve the relationship of the two. And I just wanted to mention, this is, um, this is one hereditary condition that can show, um, show up as missing a nail plate itself. Okay, so we've talked about stomach diseases. I wanna mention also color changes, um, yellowness in nails. Some of the common causes of yellowness of fingernails would be smoking. Um, um, tobacco can cause yellowed nails, but in both finger toenails, red polish can cause it. And, and the pedicurists out there will know this, that without a proper base coat, red polish can change the color of the nails. So when I see a patient that has yellowed nails, the first thing I ask is if they've had red polish on lately. And usually the answer is yes. If the answer is no, then I start to look at some other causes of yellow nails, whether it is lymphedema or pleural effusions or different types of medications or thyroid issues. Um, these can all show up in the nails with um, changes in, in uh, coloration. Uh, there are a couple things to point out. There's a condition called the Terry's white nails. And this is due to uh, a few, can be due to a few different things having to do with either the liver or uh, congestive heart failure can cause this. And what's happening is that the blood supply is decreased to the nail bed. So you don't see that pinkish. And instead it's, it's blanching white because of the blood supply. The lunula can be red in uh, several different systemic diseases, uh, including COPD, cardiac failure and cirrhosis, uh, sometimes psoriasis, and carbon monoxide, po um, monoxide poisoning. Um, so anytime the lunula is red, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely concerning. You can have half and half nails that is specific for kidney disease. And um, you can also have, again, a, um, a change of color in the lunula, azure lunula, which can be um, it's pretty specific for a few different things, including Wilson's disease and heart disease and heavy metal poisoning. So again, all these uh, systemic conditions can show up within the nail itself. Darken nails. Uh, one of the things that we always look for and we always fear is that longitudinal darkened strip. And the reason we always worry about that is because uh, it's very, very common for melanoma to show up in the toenails. And whenever we see a strip of dark discoloration going longitudinally, it's a concern. It's not always melanoma. There are other things that can cause it, uh, but usually we want to rule out melanoma. Um, sometimes it can come from hemorrhaging, um, but usually if it is a longitudinal strip, uh, we, we definitely want to rule out melanoma. Um, and then you, then you also have the splinter hemorrhaging with, that are long, multiple long lines. And these can, when they're seeing, can be uh, signs of rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or bacterial endocarditis. And again, these are vascular changes within the nail bed. And that brings me to the lines. Uh, there are, the lines are, horizontal lines and what they usually represent are changes in the status at a given point in time. So when the lines occur, it means there is a disruption in the nail growth at a point in time. And as time goes on, uh, usually those lines will move distally or move grow out with the nail plate. So the first one to mention is called Bose lines. They are horizontal lines that are dark. There are linear depressions or ridges, and I'm sure you've seen um, many of these nails. And uh, sometimes it's due to a severe illness, sometimes trauma, sometimes exposure to cold, but they grow distally with the nail plate. So by the time they show up at the end of the nail plate, very often the individual has restored their, um, their systemic problem and you don't see it at the proximal end anymore. Mies lines are white, milky, transverse lines, and they can be due to several different things. And again, these grow distally within the nail plate, 
and it, it, it's like these lines there are just they are caused by a disruption in the nail growth um, so if the nail is not growing it, it's paused and it shows up as these white milky lines merkel's lines are um, also white flat transverse lines but they don't move as the nail grows so if you see these and you see the person that comes back six weeks later and they're exactly the same or 12 weeks later and they're exactly the same um, it, it's a different type of line and these are representative of a problem within the nail bed itself and um, again specific illnesses can cause these types of lines okay so cosmetic covers up, cover up is it okay to cover up an ugly nail well certainly if you have someone that has um, the horizontal lines um, you want to make sure that that they are seeing their primary doctor to make sure that uh, they are ruling out any systemic cause um, but once they have been followed up and their health has been established is it okay to cover up the, those those types of nails absolutely uh, I, I know most of my patients, most of my patients are women, most of my patients are young, women on the um, younger side, we'll say, you know, under 60, and most care about the way their nails look. So there's nothing wrong with covering up an ugly nail. What about those that are fungus? Uh, I do not um, blame anyone if they want to have their nails look good for the summer months. They want, they may have a special occasion they want them to look good for, or they may simply want to feel confident wearing sandals in the summer. Um, what I tell people is that you need to know that, that you are not actively treating fungus, if it, in, if it indeed is fungus, during the time it's covered up. But, um, you know, that's, that's certainly someone's prerogative. Uh, the Anifix, uh, Anifix uses now the, for the soft application is great for, for reconstruction and covering up. Uh, you can see here we have a nail on the left that has a subungal hematosis that um, the person didn't want to wait for it to grow out. So uh, a soft application uh, of the entire nail plate was used and then the nail can be polished or it can be buffed and um, it'll look like a, a normal nail. Um, and one of, the, one of the more exciting uses of the soft honey fix is to help reestablish cohesion when there's a split nail. And if you look at the bottom after 16 weeks, um, that nail has, has grown, uh, the split has come together and the nail has grown to a more normal looking nail. And that's really it. Um, the nails, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the good we love, the bad and the ugly. Uh, it's important to know when it's time to refer, uh, when it's time to address these issues. And certainly the patient has a prerogative if they wanna cover up once we know they're not a serious issue. And I thank you.